Well, that's my cue, and this is a perfect moment to greet everyone and say hello and welcome to the weekly briefing. I'm Joel, joined by my colleague, Tim Thompson, and I'm going to spotlight for everyone. Wait, no, I'm going to pin or spotlight? Spotlight. Our special guest, Lucia <laughs> Scarlat, coming. Where are you today, uh, Lydia? Are you back in the UK? You're still in Moldova. I'm still in Moldova. We've just hosted the Festival of uh, Creative Industries over here. I was super stoked to have Joel here in Moldova and Marcel Ziul from State was here as well, alongside with uh, several other amazing guests. Uh, we can talk about that for like a whole hour, but I think that's not what you want to dive into, Joel. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit because it actually was a really cool event. And I think uh, some people in, in our community actually would find it pretty uh, interesting to know a little bit about that. But uh, before we do that, let me just first preface and say what the weekly briefing is. Or if you're here for the first time, the weekly briefing started during the early days of the pandemic. Tim, do you remember those days? <laughs> yeah, the daily briefing. Yeah, yeah. It, was the, it was the daily briefing when Tim and I said, we just have to get all these owners together and like, let's just process. And we did that for 100 days straight and it about killed us. But then we turned it into the weekly briefing, which has been going ever since uh, without fail. But it's the time where Tim and I, and we bring in a special guest like Lydia, and we talk about what's going on in the community, in the industry, maybe it's a hot topic or um, a trend or something that we're seeing that we want people to know about or that people are talking about inside of our community where about 500 owners are gathering on a regular basis. So this week, we're talking about global resources because I don't know about you, Tim, but I think COVID accelerated something that was already happening in the industry in regards to how we find talent and where talent comes from. And how appropriate is it to have Lydia on the weekly briefing because she actually is one of the talents behind the scenes of it every single week. She helps us edit and produce many of the podcasts and briefings that we do. We make about five hours of content a week and Lydia and her team does it. But I'm with you, Joel. I think, you know, we got lucky. We got invited to Moldova be part of an industry growth initiative that, that the U.S. government and the Swedish government had, and they financed a program that we put together. It's been going on ever since, and a large part of what we're looking for is a global approach to talent and opportunity for them. Lydia, you, you know it well. I, we talked to you kind of day one in our tour there. Um, but from that point forward, you've became the outsourceress. You've been the one who understands what the bridge is needed between the two countries. Oh, yeah. Quite a journey. Quite a journey, indeed. Yeah. What's that been like for you, Lydia, just being uh, obviously for you personally, but what have you been witnessing? At, I mean, in Moldova, just being one example, um, the changes that came about over the past, call it three to five years. Yes. Oh, well, we all knew and know that the future of work in general is uh, borderless and in a way inclusive. Um, so I think the, the main thing that changed is that it became easier to build trust and to foster more effective communication between teams around the world. Hmm. Um, and especially in these cross-cultural working relationships, which could be difficult. Um, but with COVID, with all the teams going online and remote work becoming a thing, um, it's easier to gain that trust and to, to build that trust between teams from different countries. So that has been super beneficial from uh, for underrepresented artists from underrepresented communities and also for, for the studios, I think, because now, you know, there's this thing like some people say, oh, the best art directors are in Europe. And now it's, you've kind of, I think, I don't think I should talk about how to develop a system necessarily of how to work remotely, because I think everybody has in the meantime developed some sort of their own technique. But now, like, yes, if you feel like you're, the, the portfolios of the people you drool over are in Europe, now they're like a message or two messages away. Um, and yeah, I think that's the, that's the main benefit and the main change and I hope it keeps going that way. And we just realize in the meantime, how small the industry is. Um, totally small. 
right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially when you go to conferences, we can see each other face to face. You meet people, you've been talking to someone for two years, and then you go to off or something like that, and you you know, meet them face to face. You feel like you've known them for years and yet meeting for the first time. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. So, so then, now, yeah, oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. I was just going to also give this question to help people understand a little bit more about you as well. And because obviously your career and what you do in the industry has shifted a lot over the past five or so years. Um, can you tell people maybe by way of what was the challenge pre-COVID? Like what was the problem, the challenge that a lot of studio owners were facing that you recognize as an opportunity and you started to step up and, and meet that need? Yeah, I think the first the first issue was the um, um, the fact that it may seem that there's it's harder to build trust in a sense of teamwork with with people who are abroad with with teams and artists who are away. Um, but I think that really taps into how we have. I, at least I noticed that there's two kind of like work preferences, and one is for those who just want to do the work, get work done with like minimal interaction and like straightforward briefs, like pock, pock, pock. And um, the other ones are those who actually want to connect and actually like this process of like hand holding, if that makes sense. So if you, if you recognize yourself in like part two of this, if you like actually want to have like a, um, a constant daily communication with your, with your artists all over the world, then yeah, building building the relationship, of course, because now even the team who's in the same city as you is still on Slack or on whatever platform you use for communication. Um, it's always good to, you know, have like those, I don't know, daily calls or opt for video messages when there's like something that you want to explain instead of text. Um, and I would also suggest like having someone on your team as like a friend or confidant that people could go to and and like refer to that is not necessarily the producer itself. But, but that's for people who like like this kind of like a daily dance with the artists. But for people who, who prefer the other option, which is like just get the work done, work with artists who understand instructions exactly, then I suggest talking to Rob, who I think is here in, in the audience. Rob, Rob Wagner here somewhere. Say yeah, hi, Rob, Rob from... <laughs> Rob from Stimulated Inc. He uh, he developed a workflow solution that works for him and for the studio and would work exactly for um, for these kind of teams. Um, the platform well, is called I'll Stimulated even, Work. I'll even say this: like we, uh, oh, sorry, it is called mm -hmm. Stimulated Works. It's a, it's literally a piece of software that tracks the progress. You can hand the work over and do it. Um, you know, it, Lydia, I early on, I was you and I were kind of working with clients together, people that were trying to outsource. And we were building a little bit of a protocol between us. And it felt like some of the hurdles you're identifying became a practical reality, even that you had to like understand something different when outsourcing. For the easiest reason is, is that the work's being done while you're asleep. So it's almost like you have to leave it and then someone works on it for eight hours, then you come back to what the work they've done and knowing that it wasn't always translating the same way. So we had to understand who was going to take responsibility of doing the translating of a cultural need or a graphic need or yeah. design need or technical need. And here's the trick proactively. We have to be preemptive in defining those ideas so that in executing it, it gets it done. And I think what Rob figured out with his software was to program that stuff in because it was the software was asking the question. So it was prepped. Here's the technical requirement or even uh, running a series of tests so that we're all on the same page first and then execution being done. On the, on the flip side, I think what we also discovered was in some protocol, 90% was good enough. Hey, can you guys do 90% of the work and we'll bring it back to the US? And I remember one, maybe two situations where that's exactly what we're looking for. There was a large body of work that we knew the finesse in front of the client wasn't going to be done exactly right. But if we can get the 90% done, then we can do the client facing connecting work and finish and close that gap on an item by item basis to get the project done. So we basically there's some techniques and methods using the talent that we had, the timing we had, resources we had, and and made something work. Yeah, another that's a great point. And to add to that, another stopper, I guess, in terms of 
how things used to work before COVID and how things work now is that really the first and when we first meet like engage with a, with an artist is through their portfolio and the bitter truth is that there's so many amazing talent out there who lacks a proper portfolio and yeah. actually that COVID did not really resolve that because like I know so many artists in Moldova and I have to like drag them to tell them get that reel done get that portfolio done so I would suggest being open to recommendations and trust people who have worked with someone in the past, even if their portfolio does not necessarily have what you're looking after. Try to try to see if maybe they can do a test for you or if maybe try them out during a pitch or try to mirror an existing production and have them as as a backup for the starters and maybe like do the same task as someone in-house or as a trusted, uh, already like trusted superstar artist that you already have. Um, I've idea. seen these, I've seen these methods work great over and over again, and they develop like long lasting relationships with, of course, with those artists that are genuinely good. But I've seen it so many times when amazing artists, they re are really bad at marketing themselves and <laughs> The, like even their portfolio is like I don't know eight years old there's nothing new and they have the skills and one more thing to keep in mind here is that especially for underrepresented uh, areas territories there's a lot of artists who are used to work with local clients that don't even have high demands so even though they have the skills to they are like self-taught and they have the skills to do something um better than what you see in their portfolio the fact that that portfolio looks like this is because they had to earn their living working for clients which did not really have high up expectations yeah that's what i noticed let me ask this question lydia again to sort of give everyone maybe a thirty thousand foot view i don't know what that is in meters for those of you that don't use the uh, british imperial system like us crazy americans but from a high level view what's changed like go back let's go back five years ago you're i think an art director at a motion design studio now your work is as a producer outsourceress just my favorite title in the world yeah it's helping, total genius right, right? Right? like <laughs> mastermind. but you're you're helping all of these studios and production companies connect with talent around the world but give us the big picture what's actually changed what's now possible that wasn't happening five or six years ago and now you've seen because you're in the middle of it what's possible for a studio owner that's tuning in today and saying i don't like to work with people that aren't in my studio <laughs> oh i think it's simple it's it's so simple you can you can work with anyone you open behance for instagram and you browse using keywords or you browse using locations or you you can even browse looking who follows who that's what I do like on Behance and on Instagram like if I like an amazing artist who's like a top tier artist in New York or LA I then look at who they follow and browse portfolios based on that so really that's the simple that's that's the simple answer it's easy to access anyone just be mindful of their um work hours and time zone when you're at it. So, but Lydia, don't you feel like too, is that at one point when we first got started, it was unusual to engage somebody abroad. And now that your entire team is remote, some of that grace of working with others and interpreting and working things out is, has become very normal. So the, the idea of simply finding somebody and working with them has become a new part of reality where before we weren't trying to convince them but it seemed like there's a lot of hurdles in the process. And now those are those are gone. But they ha have they been replaced with other issues? So if the mm. obstacles before were like the mental, I, I was used to having somebody physically sitting next to me doing it, and we've broken that with, with COVID. Are there new obstacles that have popped up that are, you know, that we'd have to kind of overcome today? Yeah, uh, synchronizing the methods of production is one of those one of those issues, I guess. For example, uh, Europeans are not very familiar working with the hold system. So booking and onboarding European artists may seem a bit sophisticated for Europeans. Um, 
And especially with like working with first holds and second holds, um, you may have to walk them through the process and make sure that they understand what it is and help them understand what, what a challenge is. Um, but once you do that, you, you should have smooth sailing if you've done your job right. How about the delivery how process? That works. Oh, sorry. How about the delivery process? Because um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like many things are picked up in on a team where you've worked with people for a while and there's all these little nuance ideas that you forget that you learn. Therefore, you forget to pass it on to a new person, especially someone working in a different time zone than you. Do you still find that to be an issue? And how does someone overcome something, the tiny little pieces that can be can mount up to be something big? Um, so let me ask you this. When you say delivery process, do you mean like the delivery of big files or do you mean the actual, like making sure that, you know, it's according to American broadcast specs? Yeah, I'd say like uh, within, you know, within certain companies, I realize like the way they do layers or the way they name files or even some filters that they use that have to carry from place to place. It's always the small stuff that are sitting on local servers or common servers. And when you outsource, it feels like a heavy lift every once in a while. Like, oh crap, I forgot to give you all of that little itty bitty stuff that I don't ever really teach anybody. They just know it because they're using one of my computers to do it. Mm -hmm. And I know you personally have chased that down and simplified that a little bit over the years. Yeah, I've seen I've seen different studios work different ways. Some some studios ask just for a PNG sequence, you know, and they they don't care about what is inside the kitchen that cooked that PNG sequence. Um, others do want to have access to the work files. And in that case, I just suggest being super transparent uh, from the top of the work and explaining that uh, what the concept of work for hire is. And if you expect the, um, the project files to be delivered at the end, because then that, because in that case, you, when you open the project files, you won't see like, I don't know, a different alphabet in there. Um, so just, just that's put hilarious. it out there. I never think about that. There's a different I've alphabet. Seen that. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so awesome. I didn't even think about that level. Yeah. Just yeah. imagine, right. You get the, you get your files and you hand them to your animator and they say, I don't recognize Cyrillic or the Greek alphabet or something like that, right? Yeah, but if, when you, when you, I think, I guess when producers do their job right and when they have like a rock solid brief with all the tech specs from the from the very beginning, then you kind of save yourself from this and you you can guide the artist to um, to tell them what to pay attention to and what is important. And then, you know, it takes a job or two to learn this for them. And, um, but if you've done your job well, it may it may go great from the, from the very beginning. So I, I, I know you and Joel are going to get into that aspect tomorrow in Confab, but I'm just wondering, can you give us a, just a brief understanding of what it's like to learn that process? Because if I'm thinking about outsourcing right now, I haven't before, especially someone in Eastern Europe. And I, that's exactly my concern. Hey, I'm going to basically invest. Money might not be the issue, but time. Hey, I'm giving you something that's mission critical and I need to be done a certain time. And when I get it back, it takes me another day or two worth of work to undo something I wasn't expecting. How do I overcome that sooner than later in the, in the method? Yeah, well, I guess with new artists, you want to fail fast. So don't, you know, don't hire them for the whole month from the get-go. Get them on for a couple of days um, and see how, how it works during that time. If, you, if they work with you on, like, if they're like a complete wild card, right? No recommendations, no nothing, completely new person. Um, also make sure you like ask for, I mean, working hours, people are pretty flexible at their working hours. They may sound like, oh, I only work the nine to five Paris time. But if you ask them kindly to do, to have like a little bit of overlap with like New York or LA time, um, they may be willing to do that because it's also in their interest to make sure they synchronize their 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 work with workflow with viewers. And the bottom line is nobody wants to uh, nobody wants to fail, not the studio and not the artist. And I think especially since even like European or um, artists from all over the world started being more into you know the big productions, the big names, the Netflixes, the Microsofts. Um, there is that kind of like oh, extra responsibility of, I want to make things work right. Just tell me, give me the recipe, uh, American producer, for how do you want it to work right? And I'll just do my best. And if it's not a fit, you will just fail fast at it. So it's, it's fun, uh, Tim, to your point, when Lydia and I were talking about this topic and I said, 
hey, let's keep it high level and sort of talk about the pain points and then the opportunities of what's changed. She gave me a little note list of like, oh, we could talk about this or this or this. And this, this list was like, what, 12 or 14 different parameters. And that's mm -hmm. when I realized, whoa, there's an actual method. Like there's a method to how you resource and work with remote teams. So that's what we're going to really unpack um, in detail when we get into Confab tomorrow. But Lydia, I don't know if you saw, there's one really cool question here from Wen Hao at Method and Madness in Singapore. Hi, Wen. Um, I'm going to read this one. Wen says, how about when it comes to heavy CG projects where there are a lot of dependencies and back and forth, such as transitions where you bounce from CG to the compositing to the editor? Do you have an angle on those kinds of projects? Is there any approach for those that you found works best? <laughs> Yeah, so it's it would be super project specific, but I would say that if you have, it's best to maybe outsource in chunks and like have a tech lead in whichever destination you outsource to, or have an in-house person who gathers it all together and QCs everything before it even gets into the comp process. So I would say it's a it's a it's a project by project uh, type of of task. Is this the kind of work that you're doing with Rob though, right? It's the heavy CG work. And therefore his, his stimulated works platform is kind of really a description of the method that you guys, that he discovered with you and, and building things together. What are, give me some specific details that it comes to when doing something more heavy like CG work. Do you have to define it more shot by shot? Is that what you're saying? Kind of like be as descriptive as possible or are you, do you block it into, okay, here's my metaphor. Do you slice the pizza? Or do you do the pizza by the layers? Like what kind of details do you think about? Like one big piece of it for them beginning up to the bottom? Or is it just layer by layer that you do the work? Which one's easier? I can only talk from what I've seen. And I've seen the slicing of the pizza method more. Um, and for example, in, in the book that we wrote, The Stimulated Method, how could I not mention that before? Um, we suggest- Thank you. I was trying to get you to just say that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we suggest that uh, you you, work with uh you work without artists all over the world but then you also have like an in-house person who collects everything that has been done um and that in-house person should be a generalist um because then they would know you know they would be able to tap into the different ponds that get delivered to you yeah so just, um, uh, my familiarity thank you joe for doing that yeah. my familiarity with the cg pipeline is that at the end of the pipeline there is a, an editor really a conformer that kind yeah. of collects this stuff knows it even knows what's yeah. wrong call it out push it back so there's something of the collecting process mm. that you have at the end that yeah it, with that person if they have experience they could predetermine it right they can define it even more at the beginning to get rid of some of those gaps but yeah. at least what you're saying always have a catcher's net at the end knowing yeah. those last pieces and don't expect it to be perfect the day it's delivered that would be where you would uh, mistake yourself and the timeline yeah and there's one more catch there like don't try to be creative in the middle of the process or at the end the time to be creative is the, the beginning and that's when you can anticipate and foresee what needs you have and maybe maybe outsourcing a certain chunk is not is not a solution for that i'm curious going back to like what is now possible because i'm thinking lydia over the past few years i'm guessing you can maybe fill in these blanks but you've worked helped uh motion design studios animation companies have you gotten even into visual effects or music sound design or what about editorial companies have you seen some of these methods also work in some of those places oh yeah a hundred percent like I think the difficult parts to outsource is probably filmmaking or film productions or uh, big when you have to ship a bigger crew to a certain location or when you have to do casting in a certain location. But um, computer generated work is, you know, it needs the, the hardware, the software match, the right thoughts, the right minds behind it, the right communication and the system, the streamlined system of production. And what I mean by that is like a good producer uh, in, in the middle of all that. And yeah, it should work. And speaking actually of, of film production, there's an interesting thing which I thought 
was only applicable to film production, but I've done a bit of research in the meantime, and I see that animation visual effects can also benefit from it, is uh, tax incentives. Have you mm. do you, have you heard of the tax incentive? I mean, you probably have. <laughs> what am I asking? It's new yeah, for yeah. me. It's new, not new for everybody else. But basically, one of the benefits, if we can call it like that, of of uh, collaborating with with artists around the world and with companies around the world, besides you know the romanticism of wanting to be worldwide uh, and to work worldwide, and besides the fact that there actually is amazing talent worldwide, there's also um, uh, budget reasons behind it. So, for example, when you collaborate with different countries, you have the ability to um, apply for a cash rebate uh, on specific production costs that qualify. So that's a very interesting system because I thought that's only applicable for like feature films. But in fact, I was I was wrong because, for example, um, you can also qualify with music videos or with commercials or with short animated films. Um, so, yeah, we can we can dive more into that, I guess, tomorrow during Confab. But that's a very interesting topic, which I think would um, would be interesting for a lot of people. As we wrap up, can I just know, I, I'm leaving just the last, Lydia, because I know you're going to blush, but I just want to say how thankful we are for the work that you're doing. To have met you years ago with an initiative in mind, we definitely needed a partner that could think alongside with us and wanted to solve the problems. And the amount of work that you've done in our industry, you've stood on stages, you've written books, you're helping with, with process, you're heavily involved. And I know the projects you've worked on, but heavily involved, deeply involved with many projects. Uh, kudos to you in helping solve these problems. If anyone's interested in talking to, about Lydia more, you can join Confab tomorrow, but she's also in Rev Community. You can find her there. And if it becomes a big enough conversation, Lydia, we can spark off one of our breakout groups and keep the conversation talking about outsourcing so people can learn more and more about the resources and the process and who else is doing it. Because there's a lot to it. And there's obviously financial benefits. That's why people often get into it. But there's a lot of actually creative benefits. And I think that's what Joel and I learned the most and walked away from the most from our initial trip um, to Moldova and then eventually to Serbia and other places is how amazing the talent is that is completely underutilized and possible to work with around the world nowadays. And we want to get that talent out working and effective. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And Joel, I'm going to kind of thank you for traveling this week to Moldova, but I know you probably need to thank us more than we need to thank you because you absolutely <laughs> yeah. loved it. <laughs> well, it's awesome to collaborate alongside Lydia. And of course, I'm so honored to be invited right back to that community to uh, contribute and share. And I'll say this, here's an interesting kind of awesome statistic about our community and how much it's shifted over the years is, you know, we started counting and noticing there were quite a few uh, countries represented inside of Rev community. But Tim, I don't know if you, I've, I haven't shared this with you yet. I actually went to our map that has all the pins all around the world. And we actually mm -hmm. just, we just crossed over, I think, 40 countries. Yeah. Wow. So, so there's just, there's 40 countries represented. That's just owners. So that is, I think, a great, I don't know, sign of the times, if you will, to your point, Lydia, that it is really possible now to access talent on a world stage. And yes, there are landmines, as Jed said here very appropriately, <laughs> to be dodged, but it's a fun minefield to stumble through, he says. Yeah. Well worth it. Well, Lydia, thank you, Lydia. You're yeah, thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for having me on board. Thanks for the work you do, like Tim said, and thanks for being a, a generous contributor and sharing your point of view. And I can't wait to dive into a lot of these nitty gritties uh, tomorrow in Confab, where we'll actually start saying, Joel, I want to make progress and put these systems into place. Joel, Confab tomorrow is at the same time, right? Or the usual time? This it's at the like usual time, Canada. yeah. So it'll be uh, noon Eastern time, I believe. Is that right, Lydia? <laughs> You tell me. Twelve noon Eastern right. time. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> she probably just made the graphic for it. Did you make a graphic with your own face on it, or not? Your TV a graphic with your own face on it. <laughs> That's awesome. I very, did. Very possible. <laughs> very possible. All right. Thank you all. If you're not a member of the community, um, you can go to RevThink.com/community to find out more about that. And then uh, Lydia, I'll see you tomorrow. Tim, are you joining us tomorrow? Or are you still out of pocket? I'm out of pocket. Still all traveling. Right. Okay. Look at I'm in front of a coffee shop. I'm. I can't be joining us. <laughs>
All right. Well, I, lo I love the hat. Uh, and Lydia, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week uh, for the next briefing. See you tomorrow. Cheers. Bye.